<laughs> so um, I'll just take you through briefly before we launch into our panel sessions. <coughs> So the purpose of this slide is really just to set the technical scene a, a bit more, uh, carrying on from what I was saying. And it's, it's clearly not intended to be comprehensive of all technologies and of all the links. But I've picked out some of the technologies that are represented in this room um, and just sort of tried to illustrate some, some of the links between them. So we have, as I say, companies involved in robotics and 3D printing and, and drug discovery through AI. Um, virtual reality, autonomous vehicles, and, and various others that, that um, I can't mention everything. Um, I think one of the, uh, if, if we look at some of the links between these things, so for example, if we look at Internet of Things or smart devices um, and cybersecurity, uh, again at this same conference in London recently, I heard uh, Mika Hupanen of F-Secure speaking, and you may have heard of Hupanen's law, which is attributed to him, and he said that when someone says to you that a device is smart, you should be thinking it's vulnerable. Um, and I think, obviously, cybersecurity has got a very strong link with, with si smart devices, um, making sure that they are safe devices. But it's also got very strong links with, with other things, autonomous vehicles, and so on. Um, you've probably read concerns about driverless cars being hijacked by terrorists and potentially used as weapons. So obviously, there's a strong link there with um, AI and cybersecurity. And in fact, I think the slide would obviously be much more accurate if I literally put a huge mass of arrows linking everything to everything else, because there are clearly very strong links between all these different technologies. So as a, as a sort of very simple idea, what are we doing? I mean, how do we get from idea to success? Um, it's probably not a straight line. I probably should have illustrated it as a bit of a, a wiggly line. But obviously, there's a, there's a lot of inputs. There's hard work. There's experience. There's luck. There's continuing innovation. Um, in different measures, the size of the arrows are, are to suit your choice. Um, but all of those things, from the idea to the continuing innovation, um, all of those are in, or generate intellectual property. And that intellectual property is then strongly linked to investment, uh, whether that's seed funding, further rounds, or finally, the, the sort of flotation or sale or the ongoing growth of the business. We shouldn't get carried away that everyone's just doing a startup to, to exit as soon as possible. So as I've already mentioned, the focus of this conference is on the protection, management, and the commercialization of intellectual property. So in terms of protection, we're talking patents, designs, trademarks, copyrights, and various other uh, types of rights. In terms of management, we're talking about keeping track of your IP, and in terms of commercialization, we're talking about issues such as valuation, investment, licensing, and enforcement. So it's a huge topic in its own right. Before we look at these concepts in more detail, I'd just like to uh, read you a quote from a paper that was produced under an ongoing EU project, which looks at the function of what they refer to as ICT, so Information Technology and Communication uh, Patents in Responsible Innovation. So in the introduction to that paper, it was stated that patents have a crucial role in technology markets and can even be considered the main currency for technology. That is, the tool used for technology appropriation and exchange between different actors in the value chain. So I thought that was an interesting analogy, essentially patents as a currency for technology transfer. And again, I think we'll explore that concept a little bit during the day. And interestingly, the paper also considered the use of patents by the SME sector and identified a number of potential issues that were preventing the full exploitation of the IP system by SMEs, including high perceived costs, a lack of understanding of the benefits, a lack of the required expertise, and the lack of the necessary finance, not just to protect the IPR, but also to tackle potentially infringing activities by larger companies. And that's certainly something we'll be exploring during the day in a number of the sessions, the session that follows this talk will be looking at the importance of IP to startups, while one of our afternoon sessions will look at how SMEs defend their IP. So looking at these things in a little more detail. So obviously patents are there to, to protect ideas, and probably in the context of, of this conference, patents are really what we're talking about, the, the sort of strongest uh, form of IP protection for, for inventions. Um, now, some people say that patents don't protect ideas, they only protect some expression or embodiment of an idea. 
And well, that's strictly true, but of course, the better your idea, the more it, it's protected by the patent itself and, and the more, the wider the field you can cover. Another question that does sometimes arise is, do you actually need to patent? What about just keeping your idea a secret? Or what about the fact that I've got first mover advantage? Well, of course, that's true. And in some businesses, do very well without patents. And, and um, if you're able to do that, if you've got an innovation that you're able to keep secret, um, that's fine. But of course, once that innovation is out there, there's nothing you can do to, to prevent others using it unless you've patented it. So patents give you control. They facilitate commercialization. They allow you to control whether to stop someone, who to license uh, your invention to, and so on. Again, we will talk about these concepts during the conference. I should mention briefly uh, protection of, of software and, and business methods. It is probably one of the, the more challenging uh, issues faced by patent attorneys and by businesses uh, that you come up with some idea and, and then sometimes say, oh, well, it's, it's really a business method. Can you protect it? Um, some things that are heavy, heavily mathematical, uh, like AI, of course, sometimes it can be quite difficult to protect, largely because of the exclusions in the legislation. But that's where you need to ensure that, that your patent attorney has the necessary skills and experience and you can usually overcome that barrier. So you should certainly also not, I've, I've mentioned patents, but you shouldn't neglect other forms of protection which, which can be very valuable, such as registered designs, obviously trademarks for the brand. And if you think about the, um, what I tend to think of as, as one of the things that really made, patent, put patents in the sort of public sphere, was the Samsung Apple litigation. Everybody was talking about patents after that, whereas before that I'd say I was a patent attorney and people would say, sorry. Uh, what? Um, so, and that, that really, a lot of the litigation about, in that sphere was about the designs rather than about the technical functionality of, of the telephones themselves. So again, um, moving on to management. So said keeping track of your IP. Now obviously if you've got one patent, you're, you'll be able to keep track of it hopefully fairly easily. But once the business grows, you start generating a, a larger patent portfolio, then Portfolio management software starts to come into it. And I think we've got a number of service providers here as well offering various solutions to that. There are a ver variety of other tools available. Um, IP audits, I, I mentioned that. The government offers a, a funding, not, not a great deal of funding, I have to say, but some funding to carry out uh, an IP audit to work out what your uh, IPRs are covering. Do you need to, what have you got and, and what do you need to do with it? Um, and I even noticed that the um, Intellectual Property Office provides an online IP health check, which takes you through a number of steps, tells you what you should be doing and um, whether or not your, your, your IP is in a good form at the moment. So we'll be hearing about IP management software in one of our presentations this afternoon. And one of the afternoon panels will specifically be looking at the responsibility and management of IP in a fast-growing company. So commercialization. Um, I mean, intellectual property rights are fundamentally prop property rights. They can be bought and sold, licensed, or used as security. Um, there are lots of different funding models available now, including crowdfunding. And again, we've got a, a number of providers and, and investment platforms here. Um, there's short-term value in IP. There's long-term value in IP. There's lots of issues. You know, initially, you might just look at getting your patent so that you can get that initial funding. But for a few years down the line, what do you do with it? How, how do you best use it? How do you um, amend the claims to make sure you've, you've got the best possible protection? I mean, one of the complaints that people often make about the patent system is it's so slow, I, why does it take so long uh, to get my patent? But actually, perhaps you're looking at it the wrong way. In, in many ways, um, keeping your patent pending, making sure you can amend it to, with, as technology changes can also be a very valuable thing to do. So um, we'll be, again, th this is the sort of key focus of the conference, so there'll be plenty of opportunity to discuss these topics as we go along. I've just split out enforcement as a sort of final slide. So um, a Federation of Small Business survey found that one in four small businesses have had their IP rights infringed in the last five years in, in some way. But the vast majority of them have done nothing about it, again, because of funding problems or just because of perception that, that they just didn't want to get involved. Uh, 
I think uh, there's also a risk, of course, on the other side. So you might be infringing other parties' rights. So do you, to what extent do you need to search for uh, other parties' rights? To what extent do you need to get your advisors to do freedom to operate opinions? Those are all things you need to think about. In terms of the courts, I mean, the courts are getting much more uh, IP friendly. So the Intellectual Property Enterprise Court currently has started from relatively short time ago. Um, wasn't particularly well used, but now has something like 160 pending cases with small businesses um, using that court because costs are limited and damages are also limited, but to, to half a million pounds. So that, that's not insubstantial. And of course, an injunction is always available. So that's it for me. Um, thank you very much. And again, I um, plenty of opportunities to talk about all these issues during the course of the day. Thank you.